Hello everybody and welcome to our next video in Equilibrium all about the solubility product constant. So thus far in this particular unit we've talked a lot about equilibrium and I think you're starting to get very comfortable with equilibrium at this point, especially with reactions. And that's primarily what we've been focusing on, right? Our actual chemical reactions. However, we can also bring equilibrium into solubility because you might have noticed that some substances are a lot more soluble than others. We've already talked about that in Chem 2 when we looked at solubility curves. What we didn't do, however, is quantitatively look at what is the solubility of one substance versus another substance and numerically relate them to one another. And we can do that by applying equilibrium to that. So we've already talked about certain substances that are always soluble, right? And these are these top sections right here. So we talked about uh, the four that you have to remember is that sodium compounds are always soluble in water, potassium compounds are always soluble, and so are ammonium compounds. There's also nitrates in there as well. Um, acetates and chlorates, they are also always soluble, but they're not ones that you would have to remember. They're not as commonly seen. And then we also have these other list of rules, right? So you can determine whether or not something is soluble by looking at some general solubility guidelines. So, all right, so some chlorides are soluble, like it says for number three, um, but silver, uh, silver chloride is not soluble, mercury one, and uh, lead chloride compounds are not soluble. So we can determine those by looking at these solubility guidelines or rules. Um, so this list above gives general rules for the solubility of ionic salts, although some salts may be considered as insoluble. So it does say most sulfides are insoluble, even though we say that they are not soluble, everything does dissociate slightly. There are going to be some particles that break apart in the solution. Granted, there's there may not be very many of them, hardly any at all, right? So we can consider this when we are looking at equilibrium problems. So we're going to calculate what's the extent to which any substance, whether they're very soluble or not, dissociates in solution. And this is where we are going to introduce a new equilibrium constant, which is KSP. And this is the solubility product constant. So that's why it's SP, um, is because it's solubility product. So the KSP, let's get a definition for that, is the equilibrium constant is used for solubility. Solubility. And this particular constant is only used for slightly or nearly insoluble ionic compounds. So thus far, we've only said, all right, some substances, they dissolve or they dissociate or they don't. Right? We didn't really talk too much about partial amounts. We use the solubility product constant for any ionic substance that either is partially soluble or is really not soluble at all. We don't have to use a solubility product constant for something that is very, that does dissociate very well. And we're going to take a look at why here in just a second. I'll put some notes here about that. But anyway, Let's take a look at a dissociation reaction. So I have calcium oxalate, and uh, that is in equilibrium with calcium ions and some oxalate ions. And we have to remember that whenever I have a solution that's in equilibrium, this is a saturated solution. Saturated solution. We know that a solution is saturated because if it's in a beaker, and there's some stuff in there, 
you have to have some solid precipitate sitting at the bottom. You have to have that in a solution that in, is in equilibrium. Why? If you remember back to Chem 2, solutions that are in equilibrium, not only are they dissolving, the rate at which the solid is dissolving is equal to the rate at which those dissolved particles are recrystallizing back on the solution. So those rates that that is happening are equal. And again, that's what equilibrium is. The rate that, um, let's see, we'll say dissociation and precipitation, I'll just put precip, occur at equal rates. So I have to have some solid sitting at the bottom of the beaker in order for us to have a solution in that is in equilibrium, okay? Um, if I don't have any solid left over, that means that everything has dissociated. Nothing is precipitating back onto the crystal. So the rates are not equal. And this is important to recognize. This is why, like we said, solids are not involved in the equilibrium constant, because if I add more solid to a saturated solution, I can't force more of that particular substance to dissociate. It already has dissociated to the max. So if we think back to that as well, my value or my expression for the equilibrium uh, expression would be the concentration of calcium ions times the concentration of oxalate ions. But because calcium oxalate is a solid, you'll notice that is not included in this denominator. Um, again, because the amount of solid is not affected. Like we said, if I add more solid to this, I can't shift the equilibrium because it is already in equilibrium. So my KSP is temperature dependent as solubility will generally increase as temperature increases. We've already said that the equilibrium constants are true only for a certain temperature. Um, once that temperature changes for a reaction that is in equilibrium or a solubility expression that is in equilibrium, um, that value of K is in fact going to change. So if I look at these values right here, here's a whole bunch of KSP values for partially soluble or for nearly insoluble salts. And this is important, partially soluble or nearly insoluble. If I were to consider something that is very soluble, right? If I have NaCl, we know salt dissociates very well in solution. So if this is gonna go, I form sodium ions and I'm going to form chloride ions because this reaction really goes in that forward direction because sodium chloride dissociates so well, our value for K, our KSP is going to be very, very high. This reaction goes nearly to completion, right? All of that sodium chloride, as long as it's not a saturated solution, is going to dissociate. For, so for something that is very soluble, those KSP values are super high, which is why we really don't have to use very soluble materials when we look at solubility product constants. And that's because they are already so high. We'll notice here that all of these values are so low. Look at this one, right? Mercury 2 sulfide, holy moly. Uh, mercury 2 sulfide has a KSP value of 4 times 10 to the negative 54th. Now, if we're just comparing that to what we already know about the equilibrium constant and the expression, this means that barely any mercury 2 sulfide is going to dissociate. So here's my equation. Mercury 2 sulfide is in equilibrium with mercury ions and sulfide ions. Because this value is so low, this must mean that my concentration of mercury and my concentration of sulfide is very, very low relative to my concentration of HGS, right? So because this value, these values are so low, they're not dissociating very much. So something that dissociates more than mercury-2-sulfide, of course, I think I found one of the least soluble things, 
uh, let's look, iron two sulfide dissociates a little bit more than uh, mercury two sulfide because its exponent is to the negative 29th. Iron two hydroxide dissociates a little bit more than that. Copper one iodide dissociates a little bit more than that. So these values, remember, the higher the value of K, the more that those ions are going to dissociate. So something that does, for, an, for a not very soluble compound, something that does dissociate very well would be lead to chloride, right? And we actually said up here, lead to chloride is not that soluble. Uh, I think it was up here. Most chlorides are soluble except for lead to chloride. We could see here that it still, in fact, is very soluble relative to a lot of other different ionic substances. So each of these equilibrium values will tell us how much an ionic substance does dissociate in water. And that's what we're going to focus on for the rest of this unit. We're just going to talk about equilibrium and solutions and dissociation. So let's go ahead and write the solubility product constant for each of the following salts. So if I have silver chloride, that's going to be in equilibrium with, I have silver ions and chloride ions. So my expression would just be that my value for KSP is equal to my concentration of silver ions times my concentration of chloride ions. We're writing the exact same expression. It's the exact same setup, um, except we're never going to have a denominator here because of course all of these are starting off as solid. So in this case, I have iron ions and looks like I have three hydroxides. So in this case, I do have to consider that coefficient of three, my KSP value is equal to my concentration of iron that's in the solution times my concentration of hydroxide cubed. Same exact expression as the other ones. We just have to really remember that those solids are not included. Here's lead to arsenate. Looks like I have three leads and I have uh, two arsenates and looks like arsenate. So in this case, I'm like, I don't know what arsenate charge is. I could always look here and see what the charge is. It's always the opposite one. So KSP is equal to, of course, my concentration of lead raised to the third power times my concentration of arsenate raised to the second power. Same exact thing as we've been doing with equilibrium expressions. We're just focusing more on solubility in this case. Let's go ahead and use this to answer some of these next questions. So we're gonna take that calcium oxalate uh, example from the equation that was given before. One liter of a solution of calcium ox of a saturated solution at 25 degrees with calcium oxalates, oxalate, so it is saturated, so I do know that this is at equilibrium, is evaporated to dryness which gives a 0 0.0061 gram residue of calcium oxalate. We want to know what's the solubility product constant. So that's the KSP. What is the KSP for this salt? First things first, you'll notice there's no equation here. Write down an equation. So calcium oxalate is in equilibrium with calcium ions and oxalate ions. We do have to get that written out. We do have to set up ice charts. Again, those ice charts are never going away, right? And something we don't even have to consider when we are using ice charts anymore are these solids. This is a solid, so we're not going to even worry about those values for the solid because they're not going to affect the equilibrium. So I just put a little squiggly line underneath them, or you could put an X, whatever you want. But you don't even have to worry about calculating those. Uh, my initial value for calcium is zero. And that's because when I'm initially making this solution, right, we're going to say that I didn't put anything in it yet. So initially, right, I have my beaker, okay, and it says I put some stuff in there, it's evaporated to dryness, and I give 0 0.0061 gram residue. So I add 
calcium oxalate to this. So I'm saying that my initial is when nothing is in it. There's nothing present. My change, so I add the calcium oxalate, the change would be my plus X and a plus X again, because I'm producing some amount of calcium ions and some amount of oxalate ions. That depends, however, on the value for KSP. I guess you can technically look at the KSP in the chart above, but we're gonna prove that they are in fact the same. So my equilibrium would just be equal to X and X. Well, how do I figure out what that X is? I'm gonna to have to do something with this right here. So I was given, I had this solution, I had calcium ions floating in here and I had oxalate ions floating around in there. And I evaporated this to dryness and I was left with just 0.0061 grams of calcium oxalate. I'm gonna to have to use that to figure out, well, how many, what was my concentration of calcium ions and oxalate ions in that particular mixture? So let's go ahead and see. Uh, I'm going to take my 0.061 grams of calcium oxalate and let's convert that to moles of calcium oxalate. That's always a good rule of thumb. Grams to one mole. And you would find that that means that this is equivalent to 4.8 times 10 to the negative fifth moles. And that's calcium oxalate. If I consider that, this, I'm able to determine, well, what's my concentration of calcium ions, right? Or what was my concentration of the solution? If I had 4.8 times 10 to the negative fifth moles of calcium oxalate, that was dissolved in this saturated solution, it also tells me that the volume of the solution is one liter. So that means that my concentration of calcium oxalate was 4.80 times 10 to the negative fifth. I'm not gonna be able to fit that all there, so I'm just gonna delete it. What does that mean, right? Well, if I look at my balanced chemical or my balanced chemical equation here, if this is my concentration of oxalate, of calcium oxalate, and if this dissociates into one mole of calcium oxalate or into one mole of calcium, that must mean that my concentration of calcium must be 4.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. And because this is also a one to one mole ratio, my concentration of oxalate must also be 4.8 times 10 to the negative fifth molar concentration. So because I'm given how much was left over, I convert that to moles. I know the volume of the solution was one liter that made it nice and easy. And using that balanced chemical equation, I now know my concentration of my calcium ions and my oxalate ions. Now that I know, know those, Let's plug it into our equilibrium expression. We know KSP is equal to concentration of calcium times my concentration of oxalate. So it's just equal to 4.8 times 10 to the negative fifth times 4.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. And you should get a final answer of 2.3 times 10 to the negative ninth. Then remember, this is a value for K, so there are no units for this number. And that's it. I tend to think that solubility equilibrium problems are a little bit more difficult to work through. Um, so we're gonna focus a lot on this. I have an activity we're gonna do uh, within the next couple of days that I think will help you to see this. Cause then we could also compare solubilities to one another. Anyway, let's try uh, sample problem 18. So by experiment, it's found that 1.2 times 10 to the negative third moles of lead to iodide dissolves in one liter of aqueous solution. What is the KSP? Let's write out an equation. So I have PV I2 is in equilibrium with lead ions and two iodide ions. So uh, we're gonna set up an ice chart again. 
and let's see, I have 1.2 times 10 to the negative third moles of lead to iodide dissolves in one liter of solution. So I have 1.2 times 10 to the negative third moles of lead to iodide is equal to one liter of solution. So that means I have a solution that has a concentration of 1.2 times 10 to the negative third. So what does that mean? I'm going to start off with zero because I'm just assuming that there's nothing there. My change is going to be plus X. This change is going to be plus two X, right? If I know my concentration of lead to iodide, I could figure out what's my concentration of lead ions and what's my concentration of iodide ions because this is a one-to-one -one ratio, mole ratio. If my concentration of this is 1.2 times 10 to the negative third, then that must mean that is my concentration of lead ions. My concentration of iodide ions, however, would be double that. Of course, because there are two of them. There's two iodines per every lead to iodide formula unit. So now that I have those concentrations of each of those, I could plug these into my value for KSP because I know that my value for KSP for this particular equation is equal to my concentration of lead times my concentration of iodine squared. So I have 1.2 times 10 to the negative third times 2.4 times 10 to the negative third squared, I get a value of 6.9 times 10 to the negative ninth. Just take these slowly at first, right? Because we're really introducing a new concept here. I think we've gotten very, very familiar with regular equilibrium. However, we have to focus more on these solubility ones at this point, and they are slightly different. So uh, take your time when you're working with these. And just to reiterate, remember that's a solid, so you don't have to worry about that. Let's go ahead and try this one right here. The mineral fluorite is calcium fluoride. And we want to know what's the solubility of calcium fluoride in water from the solubility product constant. So if you look at that chart on that page before, you'll see that the solubility product constant is four times 10 to the negative 11th. So using that, let's figure out what's the solubility, right? And normally solubility is expressed in units of grams per liter, right? We're going to get some practice with calculating solubility or in particular molar solubility. So molar solubility would be how many moles dissociate in uh, one liter of solution. Next thing we're going to have to do is, as always, is write an equation. CAF2 is an equilibrium there. And I have my ice chart. Don't have to worry about calcium fluoride because that is a solid. We're going to say that my initial is zero because we're always assuming that it's before it dissociates. So it's starting at zero. Um, we're going to say plus X for calcium and of course plus 2x for fluoride. And that means there are my equilibrium concentrations, okay? I want to know how much of this, what is the solubility of calcium fluoride? How many grams of calcium fluoride are going to dissociate in one liter of water? Because I have my ice chart set up and I have the value for KSP, I could solve for X because X is going to tell me what's the concentration of calcium ions and what's the concentration of fluoride ions that is present in this saturated solution. So let's set up an expression. We know KSP for calcium fluoride is equal to my concentration of calcium times my concentration of fluoride squared, okay? Let's plug these values into here. So I'm gonna put KSP is equal to four times 10 to the negative 11th. That's equal to X. And then my, my concentration of fluoride is two X because it's two times that, but it's two X squared, 
okay? So if we were to simplify this right here, in order to simplify this expression, so what does this whole thing equal? 2x times 2x is actually going to give me 4x, 4x squared. And then I have another x that's present. So if I times that by x, I get 4x cubed. So x times 2x squared gives me a value of 4x cubed. You're going to see that a lot. It's a very common uh, expression in solubility, 4x cubed. Now I could solve for x. I know it's a pain in the neck, but you can do it, right? So I'm going to divide both sides by 4. So I get 1 times 10 to the negative 11th. And then I'm going to take the cube root of that value. And I should find that x is equal to uh, 0 0.00022 molar. And I'm assuming that this is my concentration for the calcium ions, right? So this is my concentration for the calcium ions, 0 0.00022 molar. My concentration of iodide must be two times that. However, that's not answering the question. Right? The question is asking us how many grams of calcium fluoride is dissolving per liter if I'm producing 0 0.00022 molar concentration of calcium ions, that must mean that my initial concentration of calcium fluoride is also 0 0.00022 molar CAF2. And remember, molar concentration is moles of calcium fluoride per one liter of solution. So 0 0.00022 moles of CAF2 per one liter of solution. So if I want to know how many grams of calcium fluoride dissolve in one liter of solution, I'm just going to do a mole, mole ratio, or I'm just going to do a mole conversion. So... Let's bring moles of calcium fluoride, one mole of calcium fluoride, two grams, 78.08 grams of calcium fluoride. And I find that I have a value of 0 0.017 grams of calcium fluoride dissolves in one liter of solution. Let me rewrite this a little bit better up here. 0 0.017 grams of calcium fluoride dissolves in one liter of solution. That right there is the solubility. So I could figure out exactly how many grams of calcium fluoride will dissolve in one liter. And it shouldn't be a lot. It should be a very small value. And that's because our KSP, look how small our KSP was, 4 times 10 to the negative 11th. I don't produce a lot of ions in solution. So it should be a very low number. This is very different, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. So we are going to practice with some solubility stuff quite a bit in the next couple of days. We're going to get you as comfortable with this as we possibly can. Uh, and we're going to wrap this unit up, right? We're going to wrap up equilibrium. So we're, we're doing pretty well. And I think you're, I think you're understanding uh, the material very well so far. So I'm quite impressed. So uh, let's keep trucking along here. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. But otherwise, I will see you in the last video in equilibrium, which is all about the common ion effect. I will see you there. Bye.